Well, let's see. I'm going to turn 47 this year, which means for about 47 years, I have either had the Bible read to me or I've read the Bible myself. I can confidently say that one of at least my top five Old Testament books would be the story of Jonah. So let me give you a um, Reader's Digest version. For those under the age of about 40, you have no idea what I just meant. Um, Let me give you a summarised version of that story. Jonah is given a mission by God to warn the Ninevites, who, by the way, are a world superpower, that God was going to destroy them because of how wicked they were. Jonah refuses the mission by running in the opposite direction to where God had commanded him to go. This involves an overland trip to the coast, then a boat trip to Spain. A wild storm overtakes Jonah en route. Jonah confesses to the sailors that he is attempting to run from God. And after some negotiations... He ends up being thrown overboard in an attempt at human sacrifice. A giant fish, this is the part that we all, at least some of us might be familiar with, a giant fish, which is sent by God for this exact reason, swallows Jonah, swims around for three days while Jonah prays, and then vomits him onto a beach that just so happens to be in the general vicinity of the direction he should have been going in. So Jonah finally does what he has been told and he preaches his message of warning, then retreats to a hillside to sit back and enjoy the show because he expects that God is going to bring down the hammer and he's going to bring it down real hard. All right, plot twist the entire nation of Nineveh repent of their sin and call out to God for mercy. God hears their prayer, relents, shows grace towards them and does not destroy them. Jonah has a temper tantrum. God tells Jonah that he can show mercy to whoever he wants to. And that even wretched sinners can find grace at God's hand. And then the story ends quite abruptly, presumably with Jonah still pouting. Now, there's a bunch of lessons we can take from this story, a heap of them. Probably the most central of which is a significant insight into the heart of God towards sinners. Right? That's the point of Jonah and the, the recording that we have of that. But that primarily isn't what I want to highlight today. Instead, I think the story of Jonah illustrates for us another important characteristic of God that is essential for us to understanding God to actually be God. What what makes God, God? In lots of ways, we're made in God's image. The Bible tells us that. Human beings made in the image of God. And there are lots of things, characteristics that we have that we share in common with God. Not in the same way, but certainly the same, in the same form. Um, God is creative. And guess what? He made people to be creative. Um, we, we look at each other and think, well, some are more creative than others, but, but all of us are creative to some degree. There are lots of things that we share characteristics that we share in common with God, but there are a bunch of them, quite essential ones, which we don't share with God at all. God is unique in these characteristics. So what is it about God that makes him God? And over the last few weeks, that's what we've been talking a bit about. Um, I really appreciated Aaron on the very first Sunday of this year, and Tim, thank you, last week. But today I want to talk about God's omnipresence. It's a really big word, I know, but I want you to think about it in these ways. Really simply, I would say it just means that God is everywhere. 
God is everywhere. Um, Here's how I would define it. God is everywhere, or that big word is omnipresent, in that he transcends, he's above and beyond all limitations of space and is present in the fullness of his being in every place, even though it might be in varying ways. Now, it's a huge subject to cover. I'm not going to attempt to try and cover it all. To tell you the truth, it has baffled theologians for thousands of years. Our human, finite minds are simply not able to fathom the reality that God can be everywhere. Everywhere. Not just geographically everywhere, but even through time and space, everywhere. The fact that God can be everywhere at once. I can remember as a kid, must have been at Sunday school or something, someone talking about this and as kids do, we, we get back, well, we didn't drive to church, we had to walk to church through the snow. No, not through the snow. Um, we had to walk, we walked to church, it was only a little tiny town. And on our way back, I can remember talking to mum and dad, you know, and do those conversations that kids have. You go, can God be under that bush? Yeah. What about over there near that river? Yeah, yeah, it's there as well. And so the story goes all the way home. I'm sure my mum and dad loved that walk. Um, he, can, he can be everywhere in a geographical sense, but, but he's also in sort of a time continuum sense everywhere. He's present at every point in history and future at the same time. God creates time. He's outside of time, and it will hurt your brain the more you try to think about this subject. Right? Our best bet is actually to treat it like the kids do. It just is. It's adults who need to try and explain every tiny little detail of everything to make it sense to us, right? Kids just go, I don't know, it just is. And the point of that is to go, it just is, and the rest just makes us wonder, right? It's supposed to lead us to worship. Just to go, I don't understand this, God, but I trust it, and you're amazing, right? That's the point. So, I'm not going to try to explain how God can be everywhere this morning. I did do some research on my Logos Bible software. All right? If you don't use Logos Bible software and you've got a lazy few dollars to put into buying one of their packages, I can recommend them. Um, they will do an incredible amount of computing and drag up every reference, not only in the Bible, but in research materials and theological books, and put it all in front of you. And I wrote in, God's omnipresence. And in about 0.6 of a second later, I had so many pages and references and things to read. Even a sermon outline. Someone had done a sermon outline on the subject, and it found it, and it gave it to me, and it said, here's a good way to preach on this. And I looked at it, and I left it there. Not that it wasn't good, but I didn't want this to be a Bible college lecture. There are hundreds, hundreds of references to God's omnipresence, his ability to be everywhere. But instead, what I want to do this morning is just focus on two reasons why it matters that God is everywhere. Not that... I don't want to explain to you how God is everywhere. I just want to tell you two reasons why it matters that God is everywhere. But before I get to those two reasons, and before I go back to poor old Jonah, because we want to think about his story a little bit more this morning, here are just two places in the Bible, two references that I did choose out of the hundreds that it gave me, where God is speaking about himself, and we can get a bit more insight into this topic. So in Jeremiah 23, you can look it up if you want to, or just take note of it. I'd love for you to be able to... Go and look at this text for yourself. Jeremiah 23, verse 23. God says this. Am I a God who is only near? This is the Lord's declaration. And not a God who is far away. Can a person hide in secret places where I cannot see him? The Lord's declaration. 
Do I not fill the heavens and the earth? The Lord's declaration. It's interesting that as Jeremiah records God, he keeps inserting into the narrative him saying, the Lord's declaration. This is God saying this about himself. Am I not a God who's only near? Am I also not far away? Can I... Can I not see anyone who tries to hide from my presence? That's Jeremiah's recording. Or another great prophet of the Old Testament, Isaiah. Isaiah 66 and verse 1 says this. Isaiah 66 verse 1. This is what the Lord says, Isaiah records. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where could you possibly build a house for me? And where would my resting place be? You see, the people were really interested in sort of saying, hey, we want to build this magnificent house for God to live in. And God reminds them, hey, heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. You know that moment when you get to the end of a day and you go into the lounge room and you kick it back with a dry ginger ale? And you turn on some benign show on TV, maybe, or put on a bit of music that you want to... Re- and you kick back in the lounge, and you, you search around for, you know, a stray dog or a child or something to rest your feet on, you know? No, that's not the case. Um, you know, a cushion or something that's on the floor, and you put your... God says, hey, listen, the earth's where I live. Uh, the heaven's where I live. The, earth, the earth's my footstool. And you think that you can build a house for me. To live in. God's bigger than that. So here's the statement, God is everywhere. Just three words, right? God is everywhere. And on the surface, it seems like such a simple statement. God is everywhere. But it isn't. It isn't a simple statement at all. Right? The, the truth of that will bend your brain in ways that it was not designed to bend. But its main intent is to lead us to simply be in awe of God and to worship Him. So to help us live in awe of God, who is everywhere, here are two implications to consider that should help us grow in what I would call a healthy fear of God. Now these two implications really can be thought of as two different tones in which the same thing is being said. I was going to say at the beginning of my message, I forgot that I have two points today. The first point is, God is everywhere. The second point is, God is everywhere. All right? Okay, so that's that's my two points. Hopefully you can follow them. But they just have different tones. Let me illustrate it like this. Um, You know, there are certain sayings that we have, certain ways of speaking where we use exactly the same phrase, but we say them in different ways and they communicate different things. For example, um, the phrase, kids, we're about to leave. Kids, we're about to leave. That's the statement. They're the words. I'm not going to change that. But here's the context and the way that we can say it. And it completely changes the meaning. The exact same words can be spoken, but depending on the tone, they communicate different messages. So, for example, at the end of the school term, we tell our kids that um, just after Christmas, we're going to go on a holiday. And we spend some time preparing for it. The kids are all excited and we're packing the car and the kids are whinging and complaining. We haven't even got out the gate yet. They're asking, are we there yet? When are we going to go? And eventually, mum turns around to the kids and says, kids, we're about to leave. We're about to leave. All right? Now, there's excitement with that. There's um, a sense of joy about that. Kids, we're about to leave. We're about to go on holidays. We're about to go and see the theme parks. We're about to go on our camping trip or whatever it is that you're doing. But what about on a Sunday morning. If, you, if you've grown up in a churchy family, some of you have, some of you maybe haven't, but let's say you, um, you've been going to church pretty much like, like I have in it ever since I was born, you know, Sunday after, probably was in church. My dad is a preacher, like, a bit like me, and he likes to talk. 
And so lots of times after church, there's a few kids already turning their head towards me just going, amen, preach it, brother. I know what you're talking about. (laughs) All right. Us kids, when I was... We'd be milling around near the front door just looking at my dad (laughs) and my mum and just thinking, are we ever going to get home? Are we? Church just seemed to go for like 20 years every Sunday. So I'm, I'm I'm in the front room, near the front door, hoping, hoping that we're going to get home and eat something at some point in the next three years. And eventually, Dad turns to me and he says, kids, we're about to leave. Kids, we're about to leave. Now, that's not as a hopeful statement as you might think it might have been. All right? But there's a glimmer of hope in that statement. At least we've got to the point where Dad has said, Kids, we're about to leave. He didn't say, we are leaving. We're about to leave. One more. We've gone on to that holiday that the kids were so excited about. Parents, this is one that you might understand a bit more. You've prepared for the holiday. You've packed for the holiday. The kids have been excited about the holiday. You get to the holiday destination... They have fought like cats and dogs the entire trip in the car. Someone vomited on the back seat because they got car sick. Someone, even though you told them that this is the last stop before we get there, waits until you've been back in the car, merged onto the fast lane of the highway to say, I need to go to the toilet. Then you arrive and realise that you forgot to pack something essential or so your wife reminded you. And then someone got lost at the theme park, someone fought at the theme park, someone stole somebody else's popcorn at the theme park, and you turn around to the kids and you go, kids, we're about to leave. Right? There's a warning in that, right? Kids, we're about to leave. Now, I said all three phrases, they're exactly the same words, but the tone was different, and so it is with these two points about God. God is everywhere. And that's twice I want to say that, and each time it's going to have a different tone. Here's the first tone. God is everywhere, and it comes with a tone of warning. Let's go back and visit poor old Jonah as he's trying to run away from God. You can look these up in the story of Jonah, Jonah chapter 1. I've got a few verses for you to have a look at. Jonah chapter 1. I'm going to read from verses 3 and just verse 4. Remember, this is God is everywhere, but it's coming with a tone of warning. Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish, which is in Spain, from the Lord's presence. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down in to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. But the Lord threw a great wind into the sea, and such a great storm arose on the sea that the ship threatened to break apart. Now, what's really interesting to notice here is what Joseph, uh, Joseph what Jonah was actually running away from. Some people think that Jonah was scared of the Ninevites, right? Remember, that was the mission. Jonah, I want you to go and preach this message to the Ninevites. And it wasn't a message of, you know, you guys are fantastic. You just keep going on and pressing into God. I believe that's not the message Jonah was entrusted to give. Jonah's message was, you guys stink. You're sinners. You're wicked, and your wickedness has been noticed by God, and God's going to judge you. You're going to be destroyed. That's Jonah's message that he's been entrusted with. And some people think that Jonah was scared of the Ninevites, scared of delivering that message to them, and that's why he ran away. Or maybe they think that Jonah was a bit selfish, that he wanted to do something else with his life. He had his own plans that he wanted to get on with and God was sort of just interrupting him a little bit. So that's why he ran away. But the story tells us what Jonah was running from. Did you notice it? 
Verse 3. Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. A little bit further down in verse 3. He paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. Jonah was trying to find somewhere where God wasn't. There was something about God that Jonah didn't want to be confronted with. Something about his character that he wanted to ignore. And he was trying to find somewhere where God wasn't. What was it? What was it that Jonah was really running from? Well, to find out, all we need to do is really flip over to the end of the story. The Ninevites had repented. God had relented. And Jonah saw God's grace and he hated it. He hated it. Have a look in chapter 4 and verse 1. Jonah chapter 4, verse 1. Just after God failed to destroy the Ninevites, this is what happened. Verse 1 of chapter 4, Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He prayed to the Lord. Now listen to his anger come out in his prayer. He says, please, Lord, Isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled towards Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. And now, Lord, take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Right? What a beautiful statement about God. He's gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger. He abounds in faithful love. And he relents from sending disaster. And Jonah says, I knew that about you and I hated it. Now, of course, I'm sure Jonah would have loved it if that statement about God applied to him. But not when it applied to the Ninevites. Those terrible people. How can God be gracious towards them? How would God be slow to anger towards them? How could he be compassionate towards them? How could he relent in sending disaster towards them? And Jonah said, I knew, I knew that's what you were like. In fact, I told you that's what you were like when I was back in my own country. And that's the reason why I fled. Because I did not want you to do that to them. So this is the story of Jonah. And in it, we need to hear the tone of warning that comes with the reality that God is everywhere. You cannot outrun God. If Jonah was able to be here today with us, we'd say, welcome Jonah. Just dry your feet off. And Jonah would hear this message and he would nod and he would say, yeah. From personal experience, let me tell you, you cannot outrun God. You cannot hide from God. There is not one place on earth that is outside of his vision. It's a lesson that Jonah had to learn. And you can hear hints of it in the prayer that he offers when he's been swallowed up by that giant fish. Have a look in chapter 2, Jonah chapter 2. So this is just after he's been thrown into the water. The sailors have thrown him, hoping to appease whatever God would allow them to live, really. The amazing thing is that Jonah hits the surface of the water and says instantly the sea went calm. And an impromptu worship service to the one true God breaks out on board, which is beautiful. Meanwhile, Jonah's sinking. A fish swallows him up. Verse 1 of chapter 2, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. This is his prayer. I called to the Lord in my distress and he answered me. I cried out for help from deep inside Sheol, an old Hebrew word meaning death and the place of death. 
I cried out for help from deep inside Sheol. You heard my voice. There are hints of it in Jonah's prayer. Down in verse 5. The water engulfed me up to the neck. The watery depths overcame me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. I sank to the foundations of the mountains. The earth's gates shut behind me forever. Then you raised my life from the pit, Lord my God. There's nowhere on this planet that you can run to outside of God's vision. Outside of God's earshot, outside of God's presence, God is everywhere. If Jonah thought he could hide from God in Spain, you'd think that he had an even better chance of slipping off the radar while inside a giant fish deep within the ocean, right? But Jonah was learning that even there, he was not outside the vision of God. Now, it's been said that the the definition of integrity is that who you are in public and who you are in private is the same person. That's the definition of integrity. Who you are in public and who you are in private are the same. If that's true, then that should put the fear of God into all of us, right? Who are we when we think no one is watching? And none of us are above this. We each battle the temptations of being two-faced. But here's the reality I think that really should shock us. There's actually never an occasion where you are alone. Never. There are plenty of occasions where we think we are, but we aren't. We are always within the vision of God. In fact, more than that, we are always within the presence of God. God is everywhere, and that should come as a tone of warning. But now I want to say it again. Not this time, listen, God is everywhere. But now I want to say it like this. God is is everywhere. God is everywhere. And that brings a tone of comfort. Because just as the truth that God is everywhere carries with it a tone of warning, rightfully so it should, it also carries sort of a triumphant tone of comfort for us. Because even in Jonah's prayer, he realizes that just as he cannot hide from God, neither is he outside of God's reach. Like Right, a father or or, or mum, you parents out there who have played hide and seek with your children, you understand a little bit of this. You know what our kids do when they say, Dad, can you play hide and seek with us? And I say, yeah, of course, no problem, let's play hide and seek. You know, you count there. Kids can't hide. It's just one of the skills that you have to learn as you're getting old, I think. They giggle and make noise and whisper. They whisper to each other, you hide under the curtain. You know, or just sit on the lounge and put a cushion on their head. You know, or parents, you know, you play this game. We, we never truly lose sight of our kids when we're playing that game. They think they're hiding, right? They're behind the curtain, their feet are sticking out, they're wiggling around, giggling, jostling each other for the high, best hiding spot. They think that they're hiding. They think that they, you can't see them. And so we sometimes play along, don't we? Oh, are they under the cushion? No. Are they in the fireplace? No. Oh, there you are. Maybe sometimes we think that we're playing hide and seek with God. I'll hide from God. I'll run to Spain. (laughs) And God's going, oh, is he in the boat? Oh. Oh, there you are, Jonah. We're never truly hidden from God's attention, and that should actually bring a a tone of comfort this morning. Jonah said this while he was praying, chapter 2, verse 7. As my life was fading away, I remembered the Lord. 
And my prayer came to you in your holy temple. Those who cherish worthless idols abandon their faithful love. But as for me, I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill what I have vowed. Salvation belongs to the Lord. I want you to hear that this morning. The God who is everywhere, who knows everything, the God who sees you, whether you're running or whether you're trying to draw near, this is the God that we know salvation belongs to the Lord. Here's how David expressed it when he wrote a song about this in Psalm 139. Where can I go to escape your spirit? This is verse 7. Psalm 139, verse 7. Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I live at the eastern horizon or settle at the western limits, even there your hand will lead me. Your right hand will hold on to me. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light around me, will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night shines like the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. That's how God, David expressed it to God. Right? God might very well be the one who sits enthroned on the heavens with the earth as his footstool, but listen to what he says to you. This morning, Isaiah 57 and verse 15. For the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, says this. I live in a high and holy place and with the oppressed and lowly of spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart. Of the oppressed. Yes, God is a God who sits high and enthroned, but He says, I also make my home and my presence with the lowly. And I'm wondering, is that you this morning? Have you felt that God could never see you because you're so downtrodden, or you've, He could never look on one as broken as you? then I especially want you to hear this this morning from Psalm 34 and verse 18. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. Amen. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. Or Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 43 and verse 2, when you pass through the waters, this is God speaking, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And the rivers will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched and the flame will not burn you. Or Zephaniah says in Zephaniah 3 and 17, The Lord your God is among you, a warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will be quiet in his love and he will delight in you with singing. Well, maybe you need to hear what Joshua needed to hear. Haven't I commanded you, Joshua 1.9, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Why? For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. God is everywhere. That carries a tone of warning for us this morning. We can't outrun him. We can't escape him. We can't hide from him. We can't play games with him. God is everywhere. Maybe we need to hear that this morning. But it also carries a tone of comfort and hope. And maybe, maybe you need to hear that this morning. Maybe you need to hear that you're not alone this morning. Okay, we've seen it in Jonah's prayer. We've heard it from David, Isaiah, Zephaniah, Joshua. But I want you to hear it one more time. Deuteronomy 31, verse 8. The Lord is the one who will go before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or abandon you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. And this same Lord, Yahweh, that Deuteronomy talks about, this same Lord, 
as he spoke with his disciples on a hilltop. Remember how he finished that very famous phrase, that great commission that we often talk about as we go, the very last thing that Jesus said to them? And remember, we so easily forget this. And so Jesus asked us, remember, remember, I am with you always, always, even to the end of the age. Remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is everywhere. Lord, help us hear the tone of warning in that statement. Forgive us, Lord, our foolish attempts at outrunning you, at hiding from you. Seems like as a race, we have been doing that ever since the garden. You come walking, desiring to draw close, and we hide under the bushes, ashamed of our own failures and our own sin, our own rebellion. And while you call to us, we sometimes run from you. And Lord, if there are those here this morning who are running, Lord, I ask that you would quiet them with your love. Help us to know and hear your voice as one who is mighty to save. Lord, help us to turn to you. But Lord, I also pray that you would give us comfort and peace, especially those who are feeling downtrodden or broken or oppressed right now even. Lord, each one of us, will you give us the comfort of knowing your presence in ways that are just spectacular. The God who is everywhere, who can reach into the darkest places, whose arm can rescue and save. Lord, we love you. We don't understand how you can be everywhere, but we're grateful that you are, and we love you for it all the more. Amen.